conference on record. So uh, all this, man, I'll tell you what, growing up in California in the 70s, really learned to resent the shit out of people who tell you, you need to get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> what if I'm comfortable there? <laughs> what if I'm uncomfortable a lot of the time and I had to work really hard to find the comfort zone? And I didn't know where it was. And you tell me, oh, it's good for you to get out of your comfort zone. No, it's not. I spent most of my time inside of my comfort zone. It's like, now I've located it and you're trying to scare me out. Well, uh, this has nothing to do with that. So, uh, so this is, uh, so the lyric is about, I said earlier, uh, another one of my professional wrestlers, when I was a child, um, if I could ask anybody who's point cameras to not do it because I'm about to make something up as I go along, and it's very hard to look out of the camera when you're trying to focus. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Right, you can still record the sound, but it's like looking at cameras really takes you out of the moment. And uh, for me, anyway, I know for everybody who's on there, we know what So, uh, so when I was a child, I was really into professional wrestling for reasons that I think are kind of obvious. But, uh, but, but part of those, my stepfather's father had been a wrestling promoter in Indiana, and uh, and so one thing that my stepfather and I could do that we were kind of, you know. Uh, I had a song that didn't make the sense of about this, it was good lyrics. Like, our best moments together were when we were kind of hicks together, like going to the wrestling matches, and he would tell me what was fake, and I would say, yeah, yeah, I know, but it's awesome, you know, and, and, uh, and he would explain how the stuff worked, you know, and, uh, but, but this was all at the Olympic Auditorium on the East Coast. Uh, there were all these other things going on, which became, I know this will be very fascinating to all you wrestling fans here, uh, which, which became the empire of wrestling, you know, today, the giant money game, right? But back when I was a kid, there was no money in wrestling. Like, wrestling was where dudes who wanted to wrestle naked with other dudes and have societal permission to do it, right, would do this in squalid buildings around squalid, dark, sweaty, hot buildings around the country, right? And the world, they also did in Japan. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was divided up into segments. The wrestling that we know now is the guy who won, right? Vince McMahon sort of consolidated the entire game and it became less interesting in my opinion. But, uh, but back, because back then it was basically a bunch of mini rock labels, right? It was like it was Southern California one run by a guy, I think about Jeff Walton was the big, he was the interviewer, but I think he was actually the brains of the outfit. We had a bunch of people that nobody outside of Southern California had ever heard of, and that was the Southwestern Circuit. The Northern Circuit started in San Francisco and went to Portland. I learned this because Roddy Piper was a giant villain in Southern California. Yeah. Roddy, 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 he was the bad guy. He was the enemy of my hero, Chavo Guerrero. And he was like the best enemy because he was insane, right? So when he spoke, you were like, oh, that's the voice of madness. He's going to really kill somebody. He straight doesn't give a shit. Wow, that's terrible. And who's he going to kill? My hero. That's terrible. I hope my hero wins that wrestling match, right? So, uh, but then I go up to Portland to stay with Dad for six weeks. And I mentioned having a wrestling, and Dad said, oh, I know a uh, sports writer from the Oregonian called Carl Clough. We'll have him take us to the wrestling matches. So he does, and in strides Roddy Piper, and I'm like, oh, man, this building is going to unload contempt and hatred for this evil villain, Roddy Piper. And they all begin to cheer, because he was a hero up there. Right? <laughs> it's very disorienting stuff, right? So, uh, but on the East Coast, we're just a bunch of figures that you could only get to know from wrestling magazines. Right? Uh, and they didn't generally come the West Coast, except Alex Baker did, we discussed him earlier. Um, uh, but there was a guy named Greg Valentine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's correct, Greg the Hammer Valentine. <laughs> See, I'm not the only AC to the building. So, uh, but, uh, but Greg the Hammer Valentine's deal, according to the magazines, which were amazing to read when they were the only source of information, right? it was like, if you're a kid reading this, that's where you're going to get it. There's no internet, there's no people to ask. There's, there's just these grainy pictures and these very badly written articles. It's fucking awesome, right? So, everybody's all covered in blood, and even if you know it's fake, it's still red and wet, and it's on their face, right? So, uh, so Greg the Hammer Valentine, whose signature move was the figure four leg lock, uh, was known for crippling his opponents, right? And being disqualified. So he didn't win the match. And he knew he wasn't going to be awarded the victory. And he would still go out of his way to break his opponent's legs. Right? And this, to me, was a source of, of talismanic wonder. That, that, that here's a guy, he's in a game where the objective of the game is to win. 
to get a championship or, or, or a W on your record. And he's literally only there to damage his opponent, <laughs> who presumably he may or may not even know anything about. Right? He's just there to hurt people. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and uh, there was these ed impassioned editorials in the wrestling magazines about how he had to be banned from the sport because he's just gonna break everybody's legs. <laughs> And then there's something very inspiring in that. <laughs> it's an old song for Greg Valentine. Jump the turnbuckle. 